Alright, now you're about to watch one of the most challenging messages I've done at Change Church. This is for people that really want to change. I'm telling you now, if all you want is Christian candy, this message is not for you. But if you want some meat, if you're ready to grow and be challenged and stretch, I want you to check out this message. It's called, What Are You Going to Do Now? 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 1, the English Standard Version says this, Now the wife of one of the sons of the prophets cried to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord. But the creditor has come to take my two children to be his slaves. And Elisha said, What shall I do for you? Tell me what have you in the house she said your servant has nothing in the house except a jar of oil then he said go outside borrow vessels from all your neighbors empty vessels not too few then go in and shut the door behind yourself and your sons and pour into all these vessels. And when one is full, set it aside. So she went from him, shut the door behind herself and her sons. As they poured, they brought vessels to her. And when the vessels were full, she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there's not another. Then the oil stopped flowing. She came and told the man of God, and he said, go sell the oil, pay your debts, and you and your sons can live on the rest. I want to talk from this subject. Here it is, family. What are you going to do now? What are you going to do now? Family, it's been said and suggested that small tweaks lead to giant peaks. I'm going to say that one more time. Small tweaks can lead to giant peaks. In other words, if we are willing to give attention to and make adjustments with little things, then the adjustment that we make with little things can create some advancement with some big things. And I don't know who this is for, but I want to articulate today to somebody who is passionately pursuing God's best, you may be just a little tweak away. Small tweaks can lead to giant peaks. Little things make a big difference. A tweak in the right direction can land you in the right destination, but a small tweak in the wrong direction can land us in the wrong destination. And the author James Clear masterfully articulates this in his book, Atomic Habits, when he says, if a pilot is leaving Los Angeles, intending to land in New York, adjust his heading just three 0.5 degrees south he will end up landing in D.C. and not New York because little things make a big difference and I want you to know there is a destination God has in mind for you and me a destiny he has an intended end for our lives we attempted to communicate it last week. It's a, a quality of life, a kind of life that Jesus uh, talks about in John 10.10 10, when he says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you might have a life, that you might have Zoe, and that you might have it more abundantly. I call this kind of life thriving. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. 
There are three ways we can live our life, sinking, surviving, and thriving. But I believe I'm talking to some people in Change New Jersey. I'm talking to some people in Change Global that's honest enough to unashamedly admit it's thriving for me. I'm not hating on those that are sinking. I'm not judging those that are surviving, but I have an appetite to experience God's best. And if thriving is possible, I don't have unappreciation for where I am. I just have spiritual motivation for where I can be, and I'm going after thriving. Dr. Darius, what's thriving? Thriving is simply this. It simply means I'm doing the best I can in the season I'm in, considering the circumstances I'm dealing with. I'm going to say that one more time. I said it just means I'm doing the best I can in the season I'm in, considering the circumstances I'm dealing with. Because some people might be looking at you and judging you because you're not jubilant in your circumstances. Not realizing if they was going through what you was going through, they'd be breaking down right now. So the fact that you're just keeping it together in this season, me, let me find somebody that will talk. Will somebody just praise God just because he's helping you keep it together? Is there anybody honest enough to say that the fact that I am keeping it together is evidence of divine intervention? This is a miracle that I hadn't went off. It's a, let me, I feel realness right here. I said it's a miracle. Some, some of us say it's a miracle I hadn't went off. It's a miracle that if you would have caught me five years ago, this would have been a completely different scenario. I'm, I'm out there thriving. But listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. Thriving requires tweaks. If I won't make tweaks, I won't be able to thrive. Thriving requires tweaking. Now, I say this because there will be seasons Let's be honest, where gaps exist between what God promised and what we possess. There are going to be seasons where gaps exist between his intentions and my experiences. And sometimes those gaps feel pretty big, right? And when this is the case, we can assume that the way to close a big gap is to do a big thing. But sometimes, are y'all catching me now? You can close a big gap by making a small tweak. The enemy wants to magnify the gap. God wants to show you the tweak. I'm going to say it again. I said the enemy wants you to focus on the gap. God wants to show you the tweak. The size of the gap is not always a reflection or an indication of what you have to do to close it. Sometimes you can do a small thing and it produces a big thing because small tweaks can lead to giant peaks. Small tweaks. And when it comes to areas of our life that we'll have to tweak, you can only tweak three areas. You can only tweak three areas. So when I talk about tweaking, you can only tweak three areas. You can only tweak mindset, your skill set, or your tool kit. It's the only thing we can tweak. The mindset, the skill set, or the tool kit. So if there's a gap between where I am and where I know I can be. What I would have to tweak is either my mindset, my skill set, 
or my toolkit. The only way I close the gap between no peace and peace that passes all understanding is if I make a tweak to my mindset, my skill set, and my toolkit. The only way I go from being chronically conquered to more than a conqueror, I must be willing to tweak either my mindset, my skill set, or my toolkit. I am telling you, there's only three things that could put, see, you see how the enemy trying to magnify this and God's getting ready to simplify this because he's not the author of confusion and where there's complexity, there's confusion. So God takes the complex and makes it simple. So simplifying things is an act of spiritual warfare. The devil wants to keep it complicated and convoluted so you're confused and God say, let me make it simple. It's really only three things. It's mindset. It's the skill set. Or it's the toolkit. And all of them are important, but one is more consequential than the others. If you don't get one right, the other two won't work. There's one that is catalytic, it's a catalyst. It's, it's the one domino that when you knock it down, it knocks the other dominoes down. It's, it's transformative. Paul, Paul said, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing. The mind's got to be first because it is the mindset that determines whether or not you will use your skill set. Do you know how many people sitting on their skill set? I'm not gonna bother this, it's, it's too early, I'm gonna loop it in later, but who not using their oil? They sitting on their skill set because of their mindset, they have let the enemy or other individuals talk them into playing themselves small. <sighs> It's, it's how, you know how many people don't do things they have the skill to do, the capability to do, the expertise to do, the education to do because of mindset? Because you go to the next level head first. It's mindset that determines if you use a skill and it's mindset that determines how you use it. You got to use it right. When David used his slingshot, how you think he wound that thing up? I don't know if this is going to work. Or did he say, you come at me? Come on, Goliath. Knock if you buck, Goliath. Knock if you buck. You come at me with a sword and a spear, but I come at you in the name of the living mindset there has to be some tweaks and sometimes it's not major sometimes it's a small tweak that leads to a giant peak and in our time together today I, I was meditating on this and ruminating and doing some research and I saw something in the text I read at the beginning of this lesson. I think this text exposes us to an area in our current Christian culture where many may can learn from some lessons that are in the pages of this passage because it's an indication and a revelation of where many in current Christian culture need to make some mindset tweaks. Because in the text, are y'all okay? Let me sit down for this. This is why I brought the chair now. Okay. Because in the text, in this text, we see a mindset that exists here that often exists in current Christian culture. 
And it is a mindset that has blurred the lines between divine sovereignty and human responsibility. Uh Uh-oh. The the, the text reveals some Christian confusion about divine responsibility. When we are approaching God like he's responsible, that he has given us responsibility for. It's, 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 it's in the text. We, 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 we can be asking him, what are you going to do? And he's asking you, what's in your house? When I do nothing and treat Christianity or treat God or my spirituality, excuse me, like it's magic, that's not Christian. That's Christianish. When I am Christian, it means that I understand that God is the ultimate provider, but he has various ways that he makes provision for me. And one of the ways he makes provision for me is by giving me ability and my willingness to use the ability that he has given me will produce provision for me. Sometimes God has already answered a prayer you praying by giving you a skill you're not using. See, I, y'all okay? Oh yeah, I knew I had to be on this stage for this one. Yeah, I knew that. Here, here it is. Here it is. This text exposes us to a woman who, upon first glance, people would say she's in a financial crisis. And I would say, look deeper. She's in an emotional crisis. Yeah, yeah. When you, this text, this woman is dealing with some emotional complexity. First of all, she's dealing with grief because the text just said her husband died. Come on now. So now she's got to walk in her house, look at the table that he always sat at. Now she's being triggered by stuff she didn't even know triggered her. I know I'm talking to some people who know the way grief works. Every time I ride past one restaurant, Spoleto, in Orlando, it it does something to me because that's the last place me and Ramon had lunch. Sometimes you get triggered, you don't even know where the trigger came from. This is what that woman's dealing with. She's dealing with grief. If I make it sense, say yes. So she has lost her husband, so she's dealing with grief. But she's not only dealing with grief, she's dealing with, she's probably dealing with overwhelm. Because she's, she's in a patriarchal society where men pretty much did everything. And so now she's accustomed to her husband carrying out certain levels of responsibility. He is no longer there to do that. And she got babies she got to make sure are taken care of. So now she's going from a double parent household to a single parent household. You can't tell me she's not overwhelmed. So there's grief about the past, there's overwhelm in the present, and she's also dealing with anxiety about the future. I want you to catch this. She's trying to grieve her husband. Now she's faced with the possibility of losing her children. Think about what that would do to you. Listen to this, listen to this. Her husband has passed away with them owing debt that was unpaid. And in those days, the creditors could claim bodies, people, as compensation to work off the debt that's owed. 
it was unethical, but it was not illegal. Y'all got me? So she's dealing with grief about the past, overwhelmed in the present, anxiety about the future. She's lost her husband, and she's faced with the possibility of losing her children. She's overwhelmed. And what does she do? She goes to the prophet of God, who in the Old Testament would be an equivalent almost to or likened to a mediator. It's the way she got to God. She go to the prophet. And she says, are y'all okay? Are y'all sure? Y'all ready to be stretched? I said, are you ready to be stretched? Okay. She say, listen, your servant, my husband, Are y'all ready? Yeah. Not my husband, your servant. Your servant, my husband. He's always running around with you. Come on, pro- yeah, he was a part of the company or a cohort of prophets. He's always running around with you, prophesying to people. You always had him gone from home. Somebody talk to me in the chat. Come on. No, he, he's always working with you. Left me here. Your servant. He said, and you know your servant feared the Lord. As it's, it's as if she's saying, we should not be in this predicament. Considering how my husband serve you and serve God. Come on. So she's probably dealing with some spiritual confusion because she's wondering how can somebody like us end up in a predicament like this? We've been too faithful. We've been too loyal. We pray too much. We made the right choices. We're not perfect, but we try to do the right thing. Our neighbor's not even serving God, but we are serving God and finding ourselves in this situation. Prophet, you got to do something. You, 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 you got to do something, prophet. It's the least you can do. Now, this man is a prophet. So when she says this, I'm bracing myself for his answer. I'm like, he a prophet. He about to give her a word. <laughs> he about to prophesy to her. He about to give her one of these prophecies going to make her fall out. Like, like he, he, you know, I, it's, it's, it's right. I mean, I, I'm, I'm waiting on him. And he says to the woman, what shall I do for you? Wait a minute. I don't know how you would have responded. But I don't know if I'm talking to some people in the chat or in this room that's honest enough to say, I don't know how I would have responded. If he like, what you want me to do? See, no, don't sanitize the scripture. Come on. What you want me to do? Now, this is a real conversation. Yeah, because I'm about to show you, he didn't mean, hey, tell me what to do and I'll do it. He he didn't mean, what do you want me to do so I can do it? No, I'm getting ready to show you because he didn't do anything. She, I would have thought she was going to get a prophecy. She didn't get one. She got a plan. Okay, are y'all ready? I said, we're going to be stressed today. I said, are you ready? So, so, so she, 
She is coming to a spiritual man who receives and relays messages from God. I'm assuming he is at bare minimum going to give her a spiritual solution, a word of encouragement, orchestrate some anomaly or some miracle. But he said, what's in your house? Wait a minute. And some said to me, Darius, just because it's not a miracle doesn't mean it's not spiritual. That just because, watch this, just because it wasn't proclaimed in a way that we're consistent with hearing when it comes to prophecy doesn't mean it wasn't prophetic. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? So she's coming to him with an expectation for him to do something that he's not going to do. He's going to coach her into how to use what she's got in her house to, to meet a need that can be met herself because he's give, because God has given her response ability. Response ability. You got it. He's given her the ability to respond to certain situations and circumstances. Do you know how many people deal with frustration, defect from the faith because they expect God to do things that he's given us response ability to do did you hear what I just said come on let's go from Christianist to Christian Christian thought is this God does what I can't do not what I won't do He says, you need a plan. Are y'all ready for this? Because this is what happened. Now, we don't know the reasons, but this is what happened. The breadwinner, who's responsible for the house, passes away without a plan in place to cover his family in his absence. Now, we don't know the reason. It could have been there was a lack of resources. If you don't have it, you can't pass it down. Right? So it's no judgment. So we don't know the reason. Could have been a lack of resources. Maybe he didn't have it. Or it could have been a lack of wisdom. Maybe he made assumptions about how long on this earth he was going to have. And didn't realize God wasn't giving him that kind of time. Come on, come on now. Yeah, we're going there this month, y'all all right? If this is something, wait till I start talking about relationships in a couple of weeks. That's, come on. Are y'all ready for this? So I don't know if it was a lack of resources, but let's just, I don't know if it was a lack of wisdom, but if this happens, you want it to be because there's a lack of resources. Not because that was a lack of wisdom. This is what I want you to see. Was, this, was the man that passed away a good man? Yes. Was he a man that was a prophet? Yes. Was he a man that faithfully served God? Yes. And his family still was in a bind when he passed away. Because I want you to see that our spirituality does not exempt us from certain responsibilities. Come on here. He's a good man whose family ended up in a bad predicament because, not because he was immoral, not because he didn't pray. This man was a prophet. Now watch this. I see Elisha's response to this woman as a response that got her a result. So thank God for that. 
But we also need to look at it this way, right? Are y'all ready for this? I'm not saying this is the case. Let's just use the text to paint some realistic life scenario pictures here. That there'll be times where there are some people that you think will help you. When, see? Alex, they don't, they don't. This, this kingdom teacher, right? Yeah. I said there are going to be, I'm not saying Elisha's this way. Let's just use this as an example. There will be people that you think will be there for you when times get rough that will surprise you with what you want me to do. I neglected my family for you. I, 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 I. So if you're able, when you're not able, God closes the gap. Got me? Lack of resources, God does that. But if you're able, you do not want to be in a position where you're depending on the goodness of Elisha. Y'all, come on. Yeah, yeah. You don't want to be in a position where in order for you and yours to be taken care of, You got to depend on somebody else's generosity to be good to you. You need to be in a position. We want to be, and we're going to do our best to be in a position where we say, it don't matter who in the White House, we going to be all right. Let me go to this side. It doesn't matter what it doesn't matter what programs they take away. We gonna be all right. Yeah. It don't matter who don't want to hire me. We gonna be all right because I'm not depending on Elisha. I'm depending on God. Guys, this, this, it's about to get tighter. I need every woman online and every woman in this room to listen to me. I'm in the text. I want you to be thinking about. Remember this woman. When her husband dies, she at the mercy of the generosity of another man. I need every sister in here. Don't touch them because it's monkeypox and COVID, but just air high five somebody and say, get the bag, sis. Tell her that. Get the bag. Listen to me. Raise your children, but get the bag. Serve your church, but get the bag. Be with your husband, but get the bag. Because you don't know. Guys, I'm not, I'm, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, Holy Spirit put this on my heart. Let's be real. We got to. You do it the king's way. So you don't have to exploit. You don't have to connive. Are y'all Okay. You don't have to take nobody, you don't have to let nobody take you to dinner that you don't like just because you want a steak. Y'all not talking to me. Let me go. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, be, no, 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 no. Don't be sitting there in front of nobody you don't like. Smiling.
And I want you to see something. Because when I say that, you're like, well, what can I do? Because sometimes our mentality. Are y'all following me here? I, I want kingdom men, I want kingdom men to be thinking this way. I don't care if you're in your 20s. I want you to be thinking, when I get a family, I'm going to carry out my divine duty from the grave. Do you understand what I'm saying? If I go to heaven today, change, change church is good. Do you understand that? Change church is good if I go to heaven today. Because I'm a steward over this. And if I know, I know if something happens to me, then it affects momentum for a minute. And we got staff spread out all over the country that's got families. We got properties. And just because you have a funeral don't mean PSE and G bill don't stop coming. Right? My wife and I are going to be together till one of us go to heaven. But if I was not around, she would be good. If I got stupid and said, I'm leaving, she's still good. Y'all missed it. I don't have to die for her to be good. No, watch this. And, she don't have, and she's not good because she would have to take half of what I got. She good because she got her own. I don't buy her bags. I get her businesses. She buy her own bags. I, I can't remember the last time I bought a bag. Do I buy bags anymore? I don't buy bags. I used to buy bags. That's, that's 2010. I don't buy bags. She buy, she buy her own. Pastor Darius, this sounds good, but I know, Pastor Darius, I know you're a pragmatist. I know you're very practical. So, I, I see how we need to be positioned. I see my spirituality is not magic. I see my spirituality is not a substitute for financial responsibility. I, I see that. I got it now. Now, what do I do about this, though? I understand what you're saying. What do I do about it? So, the prophet asked the woman this question. What's in your house? I want you to see how she responds. Y'all all right on time? Because I got time today because y'all going to get all this. Listen to me. He said, what's in your house? She said, nothing. What? except a little oil. So oil is a metaphor for anointing. God's empowering presence that gives you, that increases ability or gives you ability you did not previously possess. So let's simplify and say this is, the uh, oil can represent her ability, her anointing. She underestimating what she got. She don't even know it's valuable until somebody comes in her life that shows her how to use oil she's been underutilizing. All she's been doing is cooking with it. Y'all, <laughs> let me go over here. I said, all oh, she let, let me, somebody, if I'm preaching in this room or uh, online, somebody say preach. He, he, here it is. She, she, she been frying chicken with this. <laughs> she been giving this away to people for free. <laughs> Y'all, did you hear what I just said? She's been giving this away for free. She's been undervaluing what she has until somebody walks in her life and says, what you mean just a little oil? He 
He says, if you got oil, all you need is jars. Y'all missed it. You don't have resources, so use your resourcefulness. To get a, to get a delivery system. That's all a jar is, a container, so that you can deliver it. A delivery system for your oil. And I want to tell somebody in this room watching that Change Global, you got oil you cooking with that could be setting you and your family up. Something we've been underutilizing. Am I making sense, guys? I said, am I making sense? See, I love what Elisha does is he tweaks a mindset. He says, listen, part of the way that God's going to provide for you is by you using your ability and following a plan in a way that's going to bring about provision in your life. And I'm going to tell you something. I want to tell you something. There are some things... There are some, I put it this, there are some things that will hit your life that are so uncontrollable that it will cause you to be a bit concerned. So we don't want to add to that by creating circumstances that can be avoided. Am I making sense? Provision would not fix all these women's problems. But some of her problems can only be fixed with provision. The debt had to be paid. So it didn't mean she wasn't going to grieve her husband. But it did mean she didn't have to worry about her children. So you need resources to fix the things that resources can fix. So that when you're concerned about things, you're concerned about things that can't be fixed with resources. And I think that has to be a shift. Y'all all right? I'm done, son. I'm done. Yeah, there has to be a shift in our mindset here. Because here are the two extremes. Wherever there's extreme, there's error. Here are the two extremes. When it comes to, to, to mindset in this area uh, as it relates to resources and divine response, divine intervention and human, divine sovereignty and human responsibility, there are like two extremes, right? There, there's this one extreme where there is the overestimation of resources where they are worshipped. And Jesus warns against this in Luke chapter 16 when he says, one who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much, and he who is dis- dishonest and very little is dishonest and much if you have not been faithful in unrighteous wealth unrighteous wealth because there are two types of wealth unrighteous means I have acquired it or I am maintaining it by unrighteous means does that make sense So there's the overestimation. Then the other side is the underestimation of it. Where people don't see the part it plays in God's plan. It's not God, but it plays a part in God's plan. Which is why the enemy has made this such a sensitive topic. He does not want this talked about. So he creates theologies like like a prosperity theology and uh, people get frustrated with that theology and then they they are not proactive about creating a balanced biblical theology they go all the way to the other end of the spectrum and now they're promoting a poverty theology and wherever there is extreme there's error and you should not be forming theology in reaction to another So their sensitivity, it's like, don't talk about it. And then the enemy starts creating these narratives. He's he's the prince of the power of the air. He's the father of lies. He he, he doesn't just lie. He always lies. He he, he doesn't just not tell the truth. He can't tell the truth. So he starts creating narratives that aren't even factual. You got dishonest and immoral and non-trustworthy everything. 
including church. But we don't, we don't, as kingdom people, we don't paint with broad brushes. So the enemy creates these narratives like, all the church want is money. Church got all this money. This is what the data say. Because that's anecdotal. Men lie, women lie, numbers don't lie. The average American, I got the, this is 2019, the average American pre-pandemic, now this is what's claimed. I'm sure people give and they don't claim, but, but, but this is the average American as it relates to what they claim with the IRS. Average is about 2.5% of their income in charitable deductions. See, that's, that's fact. In every nonprofit, it's the 20-80-80-20 rule. It's the 20% that's responsible for 80% of what happens. That's, see, that's facts. That's, that's facts. It's one of the reasons my dad was so, I just, entrepreneurship is in my, I accepted it. It's my calling and it's, it's in my blood, it's in my DNA. My mama sold Avon, my uncle, uh, had, I ain't even gonna bother that, everything. Serial entrepreneur. It's just in my blood. My granddaddy, listen. <laughs> it's just in my family. I'll leave it alone. But my dad instilled that in me. Because his, his thing is this. Son, you're not going to be 80 having to preach. Falling asleep while you're preaching. Making people who love you suffer. And listen, go ahead, pastor. What did he say? Go ahead. My father was not unwise. It wasn't a lack of wisdom. He had lack of resources. He couldn't do some things because he positioned, his job was to position me to. Come on. Now listen to me. That's some of your story. Now, when that happens for you, you got a Joseph anointing now, a Joseph responsibility. So it means now you're thinking generationally, not just your kids coming after you. That Joseph anointing go both ways. It means the generation that raised me, mama gonna be straight. And my baby's gonna be straight too. Are you hearing me? mindset and so we don't worship money we don't have a prosperity theology and I'm not judging those who do we just don't in this house right but we have a biblical theology and a biblical theology includes God's provision showing up in your life, not just in intangible ways, but intangible ways also and in abundance. Period. Dr. Darius, where's that? It's in the text. He said, this is what I want you to do. Are y'all ready for this? He said, you need to have a mindset shift. So he says, the first thing you need to do, you got to have a mindset shift about making money. He said, I need you to be okay making it. So I want you to go borrow jars. You ain't pay for them. Put oil in jars you ain't pay for and sell it. Y'all didn't hear what I just said. Making resources, what? Making money morally is, is moral. It's not, it's not immoral. He told her, hey, it's okay. It's okay to make it. Don't exploit. Don't lie. God is anti-exploitation. He's anti-lying. He's anti-predatory behavior, but he is not anti-profit. Y'all aren't talking to me. First Timothy 5, 8. I want y'all to see this. But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, especially for members of his household, he is denied the faith and worse than an unbeliever. Now, it's not talking about people who are in seasons where you can't. Got me? It's talking about situations when people won't.
Guys, she need to use her oil because sometimes your husband die. Not your literal husband, but husband representing that primary source of income. <sighs> Am I making sense? He said, I, 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 want you, I want you to do this. He said, I, I want you to know how to, how to make it. It's okay. You got a tweak there. We need mindset shifts on how to move it. Years ago, I thank God for my dad. He, he instilled some stuff in me. And my wife has always been great at this. We're 26 years old, Mark. Babe, I don't know if you remember this. Saul Hicks, we're 26 years old. I sat down with this financial advisor. We had just started this church. And I said, okay, I need her. The preachers I know are cash, I mean, car rich, suit rich, cash poor. That's why they preach forever. Y'all be thinking these people have some money. They be wearing it and driving it. I saw, I saw that. I said, no, I, 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 I got to put something away. Let me, I was 26. This guy was a multimillionaire, and my, me and my wife looked at him, and we said, uh, sir, if you were 26 years old, knowing what you know now, what would you tell yourself? I'm going to do that. You tell me I'm going to do it. I'm not going to sit here broke and then act like I know more than you. Let me go to... S- I don't, have, I don't have no money. You got a lot of money. So let me, I'm going to ask you, and what you say, I'm going to do. He said, Darius, this is what I would tell my 26-year-old self. My wife's right here. We'll tell you. He said, I would tie 10. Pay God. He said, the next thing I do, I would pay me. He said, give God 10. Give yourself 10 if you can. If you can't, give yourself something. I don't care if you put away a dollar a week. Develop a habit. I'm going to pay God, then me. Yes. Meaning, put something aside. He said, he said, I will pay God. I will pay me. He said, I will live on 80. So in that moment, at 26, my wife and I made a decision. 80% of our income is all our income. That's our broke number. If it take me above 80%, I can't afford it. 26. You got me? Many people want quick fixes, Mark, but it's the compound effect. It's 17 years of compounding. You got me? So we made a decision. We would never get any luxuries out of our primary source of income. So let's use our oil entrepreneurially to create other streams. But when it came to our steady bills, they were always based on steady income. That, so I would never be in a position where I would have to write a book to pay a mortgage. Right, where I would be in a position where I don't have to do survivals, I do revivals. I'm just telling you what the man told me. And I'm sitting there saying, man, I've been in, I was thinking I've been in church my whole life. I never heard that. I say, how many people don't have a chance to sit across from a man like that? But those of us who do have a responsibility to take it and then bring it back to people and say, hey, this is what we've learned. This is what. Proverbs 6, be like the ant who in summertime puts away something for the winter. So Saul taught me how to move it. It's in the text. And then there was a man named George Thompson who taught me how to multiply it. Uh, guys, y'all don't have the scripture in the back. I'm going to show this to the, to the family and, and uh, I'm going to pray and we're going to wrap up here. Um, it's Ecclesiastes 11.2. Give me the NIV version. Ecclesiastes 11.2. Ecclesiastes 11.2, I want the NIV version because I want them to see this because I, I was shocked when I saw this in the Bible. So I want y'all to see it. Ecclesiastes 11.2, here it is. Invest in seven ventures, yes, eight. You do not know what disaster may come up on the land. 
Now, this is what people who don't have, have proper biblical hermeneutics say. The Bible say you're supposed to have seven investments. No, that's the letter of the, of the scripture, not the spirit. The point is that you need to be thinking multiple. And you need to be thinking multiply. That, that it's, it's biblical imagery and language for, divorce, for diverse portfolios. He says, because you don't know what disaster may come up on the land. So if all of your investment is in corn and locusts come and wipe out all the corn, then you have nothing else to harvest. But if you spread it out, when disaster comes up on the land, you've got other places that you can pull. Am I making sense? And the plan Elisha gave this woman pushed this woman into abundance. He said, pay your debts and live on the rest. Which means that once she paid the debts, it was something left over. It was a surplus. Now I know a word like this is not for everybody. And I wrestle with teaching a word like this. But I know a word like this is for somebody. I know people that just wanted candy. They, they just wanted candy and Mary had a little lamb and wanted to hear me run across the stage. They jumped off online. But those of y'all that stayed online, you said, I want, I, I want truth. You said, I don't come to change church to get dessert. I come to change church to get dinner. I don't know. He preaching that day. I'm going to come back next week. When he preaching something else that I ain't going to do. And so this is what's happening. I'm talking to you and so is the enemy. The Holy Spirit is talking to you and so is the enemy. Even right now, trying to combat you receiving this truth. Trying to insert lies that we call limiting beliefs on the inside of you. Telling you, you too old. It's too late. You should have heard this 30 years ago. You should have heard this before you married him because he messed you up. Or you should have heard this before you married her because she messed you up. Or you should have heard this before you got into all of this debt. I want you to know that God's timing is God's kindness. And if you're hearing this word right now, it's because God has something in your future that requires this revelation that he is not finished with you yet. That he'll give you a plan, a strategy, so that the rest of your days will be the best of them. We cancel those limiting beliefs. We expose the lies of Satan that want to contradict the truth of God's word. And God's power is not reserved for certain seasons of your life. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory now and forever. When I'm 20 and when I'm 60, he still got the power. And when I'm 60 and when I'm 80, he still got the power. When you got married, he's got the power. When you got divorced, he still got the power. Some of our hearts are not for cars, clothes, and cribs. Some of our hearts are to make sure that those that we're responsible for don't have to worry about things that money can fix. They're going to worry about things, but I don't want you to worry about things that money can fix. Money is not the most important thing in the world. It's a lot that's up there before money. God, health, right? If I say, hey, you can have a million dollars a day, but you got to die tomorrow, who want it? <laughs> Nobody. Because time is more important than money. Right? So money's not even like, money's not even top three. So money's not the most important thing in the world, but money affects a lot of things that are important. And we want to have a balanced biblical view on it. We do not have prosperity theology, but we do not have poverty theology. 
we believe in divine provision but we work plans and we use our oil and God works miracles to bring provision in our life because I ain't even get to the text y'all y'all you can't miss the miracle the oil she had was just a little bit it didn't match the amount of jar she had but the Bible said that the oil kept flowing <laughs> until she ran out of jars because God worked a miracle with the little bit that she had. I want to tell you that your little bit is enough. God can work a miracle with the little bit you have. Father, I pray right now for every person that was spiritually hungry enough to handle a word like this. Lord, I pray that what you did for this woman in 2 Kings, you would do for every person under the sound of my voice whose faith is ready to receive it and who's in the season where they're willing to execute. I pray that you would show them how to use their oil. I pray for miracles, just like you did for this woman. Take our little bit and do a lot. Help us to make the small tweaks that will lead us to giant peaks. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Clap your hands, everybody, and give God the best praise you got left. <laughs> hey, I want to thank you for watching and I want to encourage you to subscribe to this channel so that you don't miss any of our streams and any of our videos. All right, if this message bless you, do me a favor, share it with somebody else. I'll see you next time.